Welcome to Behavior Groups, the podcast that explores stories, science, and secrets from the world's brightest thought leaders for the curious at heart. I'm Kurt Nelson. And I'm Tim Houlihan. We are always interested in interesting guests talking to people about the most fabulous ways that we can learn about the human condition. And in this particular episode, we got that with Dolly Chug. Yeah. Dolly is a Harvard-educated, award-winning social psychologist at the New York University Stern School of Business, where she is an expert researcher in the psychology of good people. Ah. Uh, And in 2018, she delivered the popular TED Talk, How to Let Go of Being a Good Person and Become a Better Person. Ah. That's definitely got to be on your check it out list. It is. And we have interviewed her before. So this is the second time we got to interview her. We interviewed her the first time for her book, The Person You Mean to Be. And this time we're talking to her about her newest book, A More Just Future. Psychological Tools for Reckoning with Our Past and Driving Social Change. This book is out on October 18th. And uh, we want you to get this because this is a fantastic read. It was also fun just reconnecting with Dolly because every time we connect with Dolly, it's like a laugh fest and it's so, so much fun. So if we have anything to say about this episode, make sure you enjoy the laughter and take away some good lessons from it. And if you laugh as much as we laugh during it, please share it with a friend. Send it off to somebody that you like, maybe even somebody that you don't like, because it's about becoming a a better person in various different things and facing some of the difficult conversations difficult kind of series of events that we have gone through in our life and different things. So with that, folks, sit back with your favorite cup of goodness and enjoy our conversation with Dolly Chu. Dolly Chu, welcome to Behavioral Grooves again. Oh, my God. Thank you for having me back, Tim and Kurt. It is so fun uh, to have you here. And of course, we're going to get started with the speed round. So let's just start with red wine, white wine, or no wine at all. Mm, red, red wine. Red wine. Yeah. Oh, I like Good I, call. I, I, you, you, just, are, you, yep, <laughs> you answered that one correctly. So <laughs> check mark there. All right. Check. Yes, check. <laughs> um, travel. If you go, if you go on, a, on a vacation, are you traveling with a set itinerary or no itinerary at all? Oh, I'm. I have to introduce you to Vacation Dolly. I want to meet Vacation Dolly. This sounds like very interesting. So does my husband. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say a loose itinerary. A loose yeah. itinerary. Not a so, minute by minute. Okay, no. so a loose, is that just having Dated. the hotels booked at the end of the yeah, day? Yeah, or is yeah. it? Or is it more like, oh, we're going to go... Here, but we don't necessarily going to be there at nine thirty-seven. We can get there any time right. between nine thirty and nine forty. How about that? Right, <laughs> like one anchor thing per day. Okay. Or, or, or somebody else has done all the planning and just tells me where to be. That's also oh, good. Oh, there I are times that. when I love those vacations where it's like I, I just don't want to have to think, and I just right. want to enjoy, and I don't. I, there's no concern, yeah. and I'm okay. Where do you want to be? All right. Here I am. I'll be there. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you very yes. much. Yes. Uh, okay. Okay. Would you do cartwheels just to talk to George Takei? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I would. And I would pull a muscle and I would embarrass myself in front of my neighbors. Yes, I would. Okay, good. We'll, we'll probably come back to that we'll at some point. Into that one, into that okay. one there. All yeah. right. Yeah. Okay. So should we embrace the contradictions of American history or do you think we should just kind of live in kind of bliss and happy denial? Mm. Um, where where do you think we should be? Yeah, I think we should embrace the contradictions <laughs> and that happy denial isn't that happy. Yeah, <laughs> I would agree with that. Well, which is kind of the basis for this book, right? So you, yeah. uh, we're, we're talking obviously with you about uh, your new book, uh, A More Just Future, Psychological Tools for Reckoning and for Driving Social Change. Um, can you just tell our listeners for a, a little bit about the the premise of this book and then what kind of inspired you to to write this? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the premise of this book comes from uh, 
to to be clear, not any expertise in history at all. I am not a historian. I'm not even really legitimately a history buff. Like I don't I don't know if we get the history channel. I'm not sure. I think I was like a mediocre high school history student. Um you know, who kind of figured out what she had to know for the test. Um, and I am a psychologist who's very interested in our relationships with each other, with our emotions. And I have been struggling in thinking about this country I love. And at the more I'm learning about our history, um, struggling with how do I deal with the emotions that come up with my relationship with our country's past and this there was some actually come some specific um, catalyst for this wh- where I was reading to my children when they were six, seven years old, the Little House on the Prairie book series. You know, millions of people have loved these books written by Laura Ingalls Wilder about her family in the 1800s um, settling on land in South Dakota and Minnesota, uh, not far from you. Yeah. And building this hardworking family, overcoming obstacles and building lives for themselves. And I read these books as a kid. I watched the TV show as a kid. I wanted to read these books to my children. We took a full year to do it. I read to them every night. It's eight books, 200 some pages per book. Every night we lived with this family. They they really became like when you look at my kids' drawings from that time where they would like draw family pictures, you know, you would see like Laura in the picture. Like she was <laughs> like she wow. lived with us or something. Wow. You know, it's like she was sort of part of our family. And so we decided, my husband and I, that we would go on vacation and go see those spots where they live, the actual, you know, historical sites. Um, and they're not super touristy, but they are sort of marked and laid out for for visitors. And we devoted a whole week of a summer vacation and and drove to DeSmit and Walnut Grove and all these places very smug about our parenting. We were like, <laughs> educational, affordable. The kids couldn't be happier. They're wearing prairie dresses every day. They would sleep in their prairie dresses. <laughs> they were so all in on this vacation. And we were just like, yes, nailing the parenting thing. And I remember having these little thoughts kind of, you know, when thoughts kind of try to bubble up and you're like, no, go away, go away. These thoughts of like, as I'm looking at this land, I feel like this land wasn't always the Ingalls land. Like this was, you know, Native American land. This was land of the indigenous people. And how did that transition take place? Transition in quotes. And I didn't know how to ask those questions. I didn't know how to deal with the emotions. I had just invested a year telling my kids these stories. And I was like, wait, did I forget to tell them about genocide? Like, I just really did not know how to deal with it. And so I didn't. I just put it away. And in the decades since, I've thought back to that a number of times as other things have come up. You know, Juneteenth. I didn't know Mm -hmm. about Juneteenth. Uh, Columbus Day, Indigenous Peoples Day, um, internment camps that weren't really camps for Japanese Americans during World War II. Like all these things have sort of created similar emotions for me, shame, guilt, disbelief, anger. And again, I haven't known what to do with those emotions. So as a psychologist, not a historian who loves this country so much, I looked around for resources. Is there a book out there that can help me navigate these emotions so that I can understand my country's history in a fuller, truer way? as opposed to wanting to push down those bubbles like I did. I couldn't find anything. I could find some great science in the journals, academic Mm. journals, but not like a popular press type of um, telling of it. And so the idea for this book just came from wanting to write the book that I wanted to read, a, a book that helps us with tools, psychological tools for reckoning with whitewashed history. Do you think that there's an emerging field possibly of behavioral history or historical science? You know, I mean, is there, do you, I mean, do you think that we need more of this to some degree to, to actually, you know, I mean, sort of the, the clarion call of your book is, you know, let's not ignore the history and let's not ignore the emotions, the, yeah. the psychological side of it. 
Do you, yeah. do you think that there just needs to be more of this? Well, I think you just coined the name of a field. We're going to have to. The citation will be Cool Hand 2022. <laughs> Wait, what only. did you call it again? What was the behavior? Uh, what did you say? Behavioral history. Behavioral I mean, history. Or a behavioral historian. I mean, I'm just I'm yeah, riffing yeah. off of behavioral economics. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I love that. Um, that's really interesting. I mean, in some ways historiography is is a version of what you're saying but i don't think with as much of a behavioral lens um historiographers are historians who study how we study history Mm -hmm. it's like that meta way of thinking about it and and i guess what the behavioral lens would bring to it is the why um when it when a historiographer discovers that american history textbooks that high schoolers learn from often present at least at the time of the study, which may have been 15 years ago, present slavery as if it was uncaused. You know, Mm. it existed, but it wasn't, it was like a natural disaster. It was just there, as opposed to it was an institution that people built and sustained and defended. A psychologist or a behavioral scientist would help us understand why we present that as uncaused, whereas a historiographer would help us see that we present it as uncaused. Ah. Thank you. All right. So I'm going to ask a question that you can probably just answer in a simple sentence. <laughs> I'm joking here. <laughs> I, I <got> <laughs> uh, yeah, I know. We, we know where that's going. <laughs> why? So, so taking this psychological perspective, why is it so hard for us as a country to talk about the negatives of our past? We, we yeah. tend to, as you said, we kind of, as you, you were talking about, like squishing down those, those bubbles yeah. of thoughts that come up that are kind of, oh, I don't really want to go there. What, yeah. what is, what are some of the psychological components that uh, are, are driving that kind of ignorance is bliss piece that you said? Yeah. Absolutely. And, and I'm not sure this is unique to Americans, though I think we have perfected it. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, but I think we're number as, one. We're yes, number as one. always, as always. <laughs> um, as human beings, we really do love nostalgia. Mm-hmm. Um, nostalgia is a very particular form of history. It's sentimental history. And it's funny because, you know, there's a lot of, you know, there, there, there's this sort of this narrative that uh, Americans aren't interested in the past or aren't interested in history or ahistorical. That is not what the data says, right? Like we, we, you know, the data says that we're into genealogy and our family histories and our photo albums mm-hmm. and our, um, our, our stories about our ancestors. Like the data says we're actually very interested in history, but it's nostalgic history. You know, colonial mm-hmm. Williamsburg is a very specific telling of what was going on in colonial Williamsburg, right? It isn't telling you how black people were living. It isn't telling you how Native American people were living. Um, and that's a nostalgic form of history. And so I think part of our craving for the, the positive emotions and the warm, the warm glow that comes with nostalgia makes it hard for us to see the fuller history. Um, we know that, you know, from all the classic research in psychology that we do have a tendency to, uh, see things through our own lens. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I refer to it as the home team bias that, you know, when we yeah. go see, you know, uh, my, my, my daughter is going to be at a Mets game tonight and with my husband and, and she's a very, you know, both of them very, very diehard <laughs> Mets fans. I know when they come home and tell the story of the game, it will be very specifically a Mets perspective on the game, right? They will not be in any way balanced and sort of, you know, whether or not the ump was making good calls. That's the home team bias. And that's uh, not just true of sports. It's true of how we see our country, our family's role Mm -hmm. in history. We see it from our own perspective. Yeah. Yeah. There's some good, uh, evolutionary components for that, right? I mean, it, it yeah. brings the cohesion. It kind of helps us make sure that we can defend ourselves from outward yes. threats. But sometimes now that doesn't necessarily bring itself to allowing us to kind of get past some of those um, whitewashing pieces that you talk about. And so, how how do we do that? How do we how do we break down some of those? Um, walls that home home team kind of bias that we have to to really understand you know what it it's good to be able to 
take a real clear look at our past and, and feel with that. Yeah, absolutely. And what you just described so beautifully is, is getting at our social identities, Mm -hmm. which is a really core concept in psychology that, that we have our individual identities that are about me, but then we have our social identity, which is about the groups I see myself belonging to. And, and that social identity is something we do try to protect and defend. And we get a lot of value. Uh, and cohesion, as you just said, and sense of belonging from those social identities. So I think where we begin is, I- I've been describing it as dressing for the weather. The idea that we just, <laughs> you know, we that. all know when you go out <laughs> oh. for an outing um, and you don't quite layer, you know, appropriately, or you don't bring the umbrella or you, you overdress or whatever, it can really affect your outing and you might, you know, kind of end the day a little early or say, I'm never going to go back there again, or just be grouchy the whole day. Um, because you didn't dress for the weather and we've all been there. The same thing happens emotionally. When we, when we go for a journey of time travel into the past, we need to dress for the weather. And what that means is the nostalgic view is we're expecting sunny skies, 70 degrees, you know, everything to sort of be comfortable all the time. The reality is life is complicated, people are complicated, and history is complicated. There will always be things that are upsetting, are um, uncomfortable that we're going to discover. And so dressing for the weather is being prepared for that, not um, feeling like, oh, that got too uncomfortable. I need to turn back. I need to stop learning or it can't be true or that that must be exaggerated. Um, It's simply to say, wow, I'm feeling something right now. I'm feeling guilt. I'm feeling shame. I'm feeling like that can't possibly be true. When I feel that, that's a moment to say, okay, this is the dress for the weather moment. And, 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 And I'll just sort of round that out by saying research by Dan Gilbert and others says that we're really bad at forecasting our emotions. So, so when we dress for the weather, we have to forecast the weather, right? Yep. Um, when we, when we dress, uh, for the weather emotionally, we have to forecast our emotions. It turns out we're pretty bad at doing that. We think things will feel better when they're good longer than they actually do and that they'll feel bad when they're bad longer than they actually do. We also uh, overestimate the intensity of these emotions. And so part of what could happen when you're dressing for the weather is you'd be like, well, I'm just not going to go to the uh, the African American Museum in D.C. because I think it's going to make me feel horrible. So I'm not going to go there. But the reality is we're more capable of dealing with those emotions. You're going to feel a whole range of emotions, positive and negative, when you're there because African American history is full of a whole range of experiences and events. And the negative emotions that you feel you're going to be more capable of dealing with if you've dressed for the weather. Is that kind of, uh, does that sort of relate to why you, you bring up atrocities from other countries? You know, you, 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 you talk about the research of Jonathan Jansen in South Africa, you know, at the end of apartheid, is, is that sort of a way of kind of, you know, setting expectations or, or yeah. encouraging readers in a different way? Just like, Hey, it happens everywhere else. Yeah, I mean, I guess I, I think that there's absolutely the, we're not unique in our, you know, the atrocities we've had in our country, um, where we do seem to be a little unique as of now, and I'm hoping this is changing, is in our um, willingness to confront it mm. and, and, and sort of name it. And so South Africa, Germany are both examples of countries that are trying not with any perfection, but but are at least making explicit attempts to name the atrocities and make it visible and easy to remember what has happened. So, you know, I, I actually haven't been to Berlin or to South Africa, the country South of South Africa. Um, but what I've read about in both places is there are a lot of visible reminders of apartheid, of the Holocaust. And we don't have a lot of that in the United States. It's kind of curious. I was actually shocked to learn that the United States government has never issued a formal apology for slavery. Hmm. I mean, that's, wow. that's sort of mind. I mean, like, it's ever so, the, the, yeah. be a no brainer. That, yeah, no brainer. That's a no brainer. And, and it has come up, but it hasn't happened. Is, the, is part of this, I think, forgive me if I'm way going down the wrong path here, but I, 
I, I believe that there's this fear by some that when you dismantle this narrative that's been told about who we are and how we came to be, that you end up changing who we are today. And that this oh. idea that we could somehow become worse because of that, because we've had this kind of uh, belief of of how great and perfect we yeah. were, that that inspires us to be great and perfect today. Is there is there yeah. any any truth to that? I mean, because, again, I I don't I don't take that that belief, but I believe that that might be part of what's going on out there. Yeah, no, I think that's very real and very relatable. Um, I have, I have two thoughts that come up with that. I mean, one is, you know, for those who are parents, I think we know the difference between the Instagram version of our kids. And, <laughs> okay. And, 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 um. and, and our kids, right? And we love our kids. We don't need the Instagram version uh, to, to love our children. Um, well, you know, I have two teenagers. <laughs> it's part of, it's just part of who they are. It's just right? part of who they are. Yeah. And so the, Instagram version of our country, which is sort of flawless and airbrushed, I, I I think that feeling we have that will we still, you know, will it still be ours? Will we still love it if we see the real version, not the Instagram version? I can I I can see how that's uh, definitely something that a lot of us might worry about. But I think it, there are other parts of our lives, like parenting, where we 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 know we can do both. Yeah. We can see both. And that leads to my second thought, which is the wonderful research that Wendy Smith and others have done on paradox mm. has been really liberating for me. I mean, this this just unlocked a lot for me when it comes to my relationship with uh, our country's past, which is paradox. Um, a paradox is one in, where we have contradictory truths and we... We have to sit with both of them in contradiction. Our minds want to smooth over paradox. They want, it wants, our mind wants, you know, the picture on the wall wants to kind of straighten it when it's a little crooked. Um, and it does that with facts and truths in our brain as well. It just wants to kind of like make everything fit. But sometimes everything doesn't fit. Sometimes it is true that the forefathers of our country did extraordinary things had extraordinary visions, overcame extraordinary odds, wrote extraordinary documents, had extraordinary um, processes for bringing this to life. And many of our forefathers, while they were doing that, while they were bringing a vision of equality and liberty and justice to life, were enslaving human beings, were separating children from their parents, were torturing people who tried to escape. The same people were doing both. And I mean, even as I say this, like I just tensed up, like saying yeah. that, like it was so uncomfortable to say. Um, and yet it's so well documented that both of those things are true. And that kind of paradox, uh, you know, to, to, to get back to this notion of if we let go of the Instagram version of our country, you know, what, what do we lose? I, I think if we can allow both things to be true, we find a way to move forward. Uh, the, the research on paradox says when we embrace paradox or have a paradox mindset, as they call it, we become more resilient. We become more creative. And I think that's what we need in this country right now moving forward. How do you come to this? You, I, I just, if you don't mind me asking just very personally with the incredible amount of research that you did for, for this book, you got to look beyond, you needed to look beyond the Instagram view of the United States. How do you come out on this? Like, are you more down? Are you more like, oh, you know, more yeah. problems? You know, what, right. how do you feel about all this? Yeah. Well, I mean, absolutely. I have moments of complete dismay and disgust. And like, you know, it, you learn things and you're just like that, that. How? How could human beings have done that to other human beings? Um, and I realize that's naive. I mean, we have many examples of, of cruelty and, and atrocity in the world. And I just have to keep being reminded of that. Um, that said, I have to say, I, I got to find the right adjective for this. There's something as I learn more that it's not, the word is not satisfying. I, I'm, I'm, that's the wrong word, but there's something that just things are making more sense in the world around me. Mm. Like when I look around and I see, um, you know, such disparities by race in our country. 
it just seems so strange. Like, I can't explain it. Like, why is it like this? And then when you start to connect the dots between where people live today, you know, the neighborhoods they live in, the cities they live in, the areas they live in, the schools they go to, the healthcare they get, the wealth they have, and you start to connect the dots, you know, decade by decade, it actually all makes sense. How would it be any other way? Mm. Once you know our history, how would we possibly have any other present? And then that's the, the, so I think the word is not satisfying. It's clarifying. Mm. That's incredibly clarifying. Yeah. Um, as opposed to just looking around at the world and just feeling like, well, I don't know. Like I have no explanation for how it, why it is the way it is. Yeah. And, and, and you love this country. This isn't, oh my a, God. this isn't a, I'm ready to beat up on America. No, I, thank you for, for allowing me to articulate that. I love this country. I am the children of immigrants who gave up everything to be in this country and have, you know, heard my entire life. We live in the greatest country on earth. And, um, I deeply love this country. And I think for me, it's a matter of, how do I love this country the way I love my kids mm. um, unconditionally? So even I don't have to like everything my country does to love my country. <laughs> I it is, that, it is I, like your kids. Yeah, yeah exactly. But, but I think that's so important, right? This idea that, look, you can you can look back with clarity yeah. and you can see all the warts and the 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 bruises and all the bad things that that have happened. Yeah. And that doesn't mean that you don't love that that history, that the country that that is now. You don't have to like the things that the country did. It, and that, I think, goes back to that fear piece, right? That fear yeah. that I talked about earlier that if you change it, no, because you, you exactly like your kids. If you look at all of the things they do, you don't like everything they do. I don't like that I have to yell at my kids 10 times to get up to go to, to school in the morning. I don't <laughs> like that, you know, those are the things that are going on. But that's the reality. And I still love them regardless of that. And and it just makes me understand them more. And And now it's like, all right, so how do I help them so I don't have to do that? And I think that's where you're going with this book. So, So how do we... How do we take that clarity that we have around the past and make it so that we do get a more just future? What what are some of the things that we can do? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, we've already talked about a couple of them. Embracing paradox, really important, really liberating. Um, connecting the dots between the past and the present. So there's some great research by psychologist Pia Salter and her co-authors that have looked at how giving folks just a little bit of historical knowledge increases their ability to recognize systemic racism in the present. Mm -hmm. And so they call this the Marley hypothesis. Um, at first, I thought one of the psychologists must have the last name Marley, but it's actually Bob Marley. They're <laughs> <referring. laughs> Uh-oh, you got Tim's Tim's ears there just perked go. up. Here, go. Go. here comes exactly. the music. Musical there reference, musical reference. Exactly. You know, it's a, it's oh. a riff off of um, Buffalo Soldier, the song by yeah. Bob Marley, where he refers to not knowing your history. Yeah. And so the Marley hypothesis is speaking to the value to us in knowing some of our history in seeing how that history is showing up in the present. And, th and that's really, a lot of people talk about you know, if we don't know our history, we're doomed to repeat it. And, and you know, maybe there's truth to that. But I'm actually, I'm being even more present oriented in the sense that if we don't know our history, we will not see it in the present. Mm. And it is in the present. Um, and many people are currently living with the the harm of the past in their present day lives. And so that and and because some some people are and some people aren't there's this like well if it's not raining where i am it must not be raining where you are yeah. kind of divide in thinking and we just end up at odds where you know we have um a significant percentage of white americans believe there's more discrimination against white people than black people in the united states even though there's you know very clear data that that's not true um but I think that speaks to this divide in knowledge about our past. Yeah. We talked to Robert Livingston um, mm. uh, from Harvard uh, yeah. a 
a few weeks ago. And he talked about how when people start complaining about affirmative action, you know, like, you know, like, what about white people? And he's like, white people, white men have been getting affirmative action for the last 500 years. Right, right, <laughs> right, 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 right. So, so come on. We're actually, you know, let's, let's actually start to just, let's just try to bring a little more balance to the, right. to the picture. Right. Do, do you think that this is it, it that this, these solutions they sound pretty in almost sort of common sense they're yeah. simple but not easy Whoa, that's I love that simple but not easy yeah I think I, again in a lot of parts of our life we know how to do this like we do do this we we're able to sort of you know look at multiple perspectives we're able to 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 sort of reckon with things that are uncomfortable but there is this you know, deeply held narrative we have about our country. And th- what we're having to do here is unlearn something. Um, and unlearning is much harder than learning. Uh-huh. Uh, and and um, researchers who've looked at even young children have found that teaching a scientific belief to a child correctly, we might think it's very complex to explain some scientific concept, but it actually, the kid will grasp it more easily than if you explain it in an overly simplified way, and then later have to have them unlearn that and relearn the correct version. Um, and, you know, in that, that Little House on the Prairie um, story I told, what I sit with is that I basically saddled my kids with a whole bunch of unlearning they're going to have mm. to do. You know, that is the debt I have laid on their lap that they're going to have to unteach themselves what I taught them. So, so uh, that's part of what makes this hard is we've been breathing in very specific narratives from everything from our holidays to our textbooks to our, um, our sort of, uh, our actual historical knowledge that we're trying to unlearn now. Not because it, it's all untrue. Some of it's true. Some of it's not, but it's not fully true. Yeah. We talked about you doing cartwheels in the speed <laughs> round um, to talk to George Taki of, of Star Trek fame, right? Uh, he played, uh, was he Sulu? He was Sulu, right? Was he? Yeah. Yes, on on yes. that. So, um, but you bring him up in the book and hold him up as a great example of gritty, uh, as a gritty patriot. So right. what do you mean by a gritty patriot and and why does George embody that essence? And then maybe even talk a little bit about why you were doing cartwheels. So I know, <laughs> right? Yeah. Okay. So, so, uh, you know, I don't know George personally. Well, I didn't at the time. And I really wanted to interview him because, well, first, I mean, he's, you know, an icon. He's George, um, yeah. I mean, right? Um, he, he, you know, just in terms of like celebrity relevance, I can't think of someone who's been as relevant as long as he has, like 50 years of being in the limelight for all different reasons. He has now like millions and millions of social media followers. He's very active and sort of um, uh, using his influence in that way. What what some people know, but a lot of people don't, and he's very actively trying to spread the word, is that when he was four years old, his family, a Japanese-American family living in California, was taken from their homes by the U.S. government, put behind barbed wire, men with soldiers, because the U.S. and Japan were at war with each other, and the U.S. government feared that 120,000 Japanese-Americans were at risk of becoming traitors to the United States. This is not for a crime they had committed. This was for a crime uncommitted that maybe they might someday in the future. They were imprisoned. He was four years old and he spent several years of his childhood incarcerated. I mean, it's a mind-boggling thought. Um, His family was left homeless, jobless. They had a dry cleaning business that they lost, their home they lost, and I wanted to speak to him because he's he's written a book about this. He's helped create a Broadway musical that's actually now playing in London. Um, I'm about to open in London called Allegiance about the story because he really thinks it's important that we fully understand what happened there, that it wasn't a comfortable or fair uh, moment in our history. I So I wanted to speak to him about that. What 
what emerged, well, first of all, so I wanted to speak to him. I didn't know him. So I was like trying to get a note to him through, through a variety of sources. And in my email that I sent him asking to interview him, I ended the email with something like, I'll do cartwheels if you say yes. <laughs> and then imagine my surprise when an email shows up in my inbox saying, hi, Dolly, I'd love to see that cartwheel. When can we speak? And I'm like, what? Oh my God. And I love that you actually did it. You were well, I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, did I have a choice? I mean, George no. wants to see my cartwheel. No, you didn't have a choice. No. <laughs> what self-respecting. So, yeah, so there we were in the front lawn and my kids were like, oh, my God, Mom, you're terrible or whatever. Tuck your shirt in. <laughs> so embarrassing. So we sent him the video and you can hear my kids kind of like badgering me in the background. Um, but he loved it. We got on the phone and he sang hello. Hello, Dolly, to me. Oh. Can you imagine in that beautiful voice, oh. he sang Hello, Dolly, to me. Wow. I, I would like, I, you know, it was like a peak, peak life experience. Um, so, <laughs> oh, cool. so enough about me. Let me tell you about George. Um, what really struck me when he told me, I mean, this was 80 years ago, and his, you can still hear the emotion in his voice when he mm-hmm. describes his parents' face faces when those soldiers came to the door to take them away when his father said to him quickly go get dressed when his mother started to cry he he can still picture that moment and speak to it and when he describes the pain of the that era he also speaks of president roosevelt of fdr as a great president mm. well president wow. roosevelt was the one that issued the executive order yeah so I, like talk about paradox So he says, well, he made a terrible mistake. He got swept up in the racist narratives of the time. He didn't have a lot of knowledge, but he also built incredible infrastructure in our country, bridges and museums and things we needed. He brought us out of the depression. He he speaks with an ability to see that paradox and the term that came to my mind as I spoke to him is grit. Hmm. Angela Duckworth, psychologist at the University of Pennsylvania, talks about grit being passion and perseverance in pursuit of a meaningful long-term goal. And a lot of us show grit, you know, as parents, we show grit. As podcast creators, I'm sure you have to have grit. Like there's, there's a lot of parts of our lives where we have to have grit and we know how to do that. We don't often think of love of country as a place where we need grit or patriotism. We just think we're entitled to it. Like, of course, I'm entitled to love my country and to like my country all the time. This is America. What I hear in his story and in his actions is this is something active I do. I have to have passion and perseverance for my love of country. Mm. And in doing that and taking that active agentic stance, I will continue to make my country better. And so being a gritty patriot is having that sort of active love of country. Wow. <laughs> Tim, Tim is speechless, which doesn't happen very often. So, <laughs> I just, oh, so I'm just reverential. Dolly, that was just so beautiful. That was just really Thank touching. You. So in the book, you also bring up a couple different concepts that I thought were interesting, and maybe we can just talk about them briefly. You talk about belief grief. You talk about psychological distance playing into our reckoning with the past and this idea also of psychological entitlement, which I think you were just kind of kind of emphasizing there. Can you talk a little bit about what each of those is like belief, uh, belief grief? Let's start with that. What, what sure. does that what does that do to us? Absolutely. Um, so belief grief was a term I coined to capture this idea of what happens when a deeply held, um, narrative that is part of our social identity turns out to be untrue or partially true. That genuine grief we feel is real. Mm. And I wanted to name it to normalize how awful it feels. So if, if you've believed your whole life, that Columbus Day captures um, a heroic figure who kindly greeted the indigenous <laughs> peoples of who were on this land that we now call the United States of America, and that he was the first to discover this land. If if that belief gets challenged by the facts that he was actually quite cruel, um, that there was 
all sorts of uh, abuse and, and enslavement and kidnapping of people, then that grief that we feel um, becomes, I think, easier to work our way through it. Mm. You know, just like all forms of grief, we have to work our way through it. Uh, but by, by naming it, I think it allows us to feel the emotions we feel and then move on. So belief grief speaks to that. And then psychological distance. You talk about yeah. that and and how does that play into reckoning with our past and building, yep. of bringing that more just future to, to fruition? Yeah. Um, so psychological distance is a concept, um, a very rich area of research by uh, Trope and Lieberman, where they've looked at uh, just like physical distance, like if I look at something far off versus close, it's, bl- it's well, these days with my glasses and all, <laughs> everything's blurry, honestly, but we'll just stick with the metaphor. The idea that something further off is blurrier than the stuff that's close to us. Um, the psychological distance says that things that are far off in time or um, far off in sort of how real they seem to us are also blurrier. Mm -hmm. What's really interesting about that is that it turns out um, research by Eugene Caruso and others says it's also particular, like there's a wrinkle in time where things in the past are particularly blurry um, compared to the future. Like we don't, we we look at, if we look at a hundred years in the past versus a hundred years in the future, there's something about the past that seems even longer ago. I I sort of have been calling that the long time ago illusion. Long time ago. Yeah. And so psychological distance um, plays a little trick on our brain where when things have happened in the past, they seem blurrier, they seem more distant. And some, some studies show we tend to blame the victims more Mm. when something happened in the past. So again, it distorts our understanding of, of the past. It, maybe sets us up to think, whoa, was slavery really that bad? You know, they fed them, they housed them, you know, isn't that, you know, if, so, so you can see how that narrative could emerge because of these, these psychological phenomena. Yeah. That's, that's a perfect way to get to uh, American Pie and Rocket Man, <laughs> by the way, <laughs> through, uh, through. Okay. All right. I just, I, I'm I just listeners. I want to see how many cartwheels <laughs> Tim is going to do in order to make this connection happen here. So just uh, let's, let's, let's sit back and watch Tim watch. do some cartwheels. Here we go. Dolly, you use to explain the long time ago illusion one of the examples you give is is this juxtaposition of this very same year that american pie don mclean's yeah. you know heroic <laughs> yeah. ballad heroic. and rocket Ro- rocket man one of elton john's um, greatest hits happens the same year that the tuskegee experiment on african-american men was treating them you know, are not treating them for syphilis. Right. right. You know, I mean, just to see how horrible the disease can be happens at the same time. And, and yet our minds seem to just say, oh, no, 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 that was that was a long time ago. Totally. Exactly. Right. Like, you know, I I, I was in kindergarten then. I, I mean, I was, you know, it, it, this this was in our lifetimes. And yes, the long time ago illusion. It, another great example of that that, you know, I recently heard was. Anne Frank, Martin Luther King, if they were both alive today, would be the same age as Barbara Walters. Wow. Wow. They were all born in 1929. I mean, that's just bizarre. But we think of the Holocaust as so long ago. We think of the civil rights movement as so long ago. So our mind really plays tricks on us. Wow. Wow. Okay. That's good. Tim. Very, very good cartwheel. And by <laughs> the way, good. I, that your, was good. Your feet were nicely positioned. You did that very <laughs> well. A good arch. It worked. Landed it. It landed, landed it. it. It was yeah. like nailed it, man. That was a, the nine point three on a ten ten scale there. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Dolly, can we can we ask what what's on your playlist these days? You, you, um, my recollection is that when you're when you're writing, you're not listening to to music. You you don't like to have. Well, I was. Um... I think I, I can't remember exactly when we last spoke what I was doing, but I I have definitely gotten into a pattern of listening to um, things like the Hamilton soundtrack or the cast, cast album or the In the Heights cast album or a few other shows like that when I write because uh, I love the energy of it, I love the humanity of it, I love the um, 
precision of the words. Yeah. Like, you know that every note, every word was crafted. And that is very motivating when, when I'm writing. So oh. that's definitely in the background. Oh, my, cool. my my daughter uh, would be a, a big fan. She is huge yeah. into Broadway musicals. <gasps> That's what she listens to all the time. It's really? Like, you know, on, on repeat and whatever, yeah, you know, can play top 40 stuff. Nope. She wants to listen to the Broadway whenever we get wow. in the car. So it's a fantastic. Oh, so I've listened lovely. to all of those many, many yes. times. Yes, <laughs> I bet. I bet. I love, I love that you can listen with her. Yes. So, um. Oh, Tim, you want to keep talking music? No, you, you go right ahead. Kurt. Uh, so I have, I I have one last I question. I, I have I have one last question for you. Um, okay. So we are going to be talking uh, with Max Bazerman in oh, in a yeah. couple of weeks, and you know he has a new book, Complicit: How We Enable the Unethical and How to Stop. So what would you? What would be the question that you would want us to ask him? Oh wow! <laughs> Ooh, deep would, question. Would, and uh, just for listeners' sake, this is yeah. coming from a long, close relationship that you have with Max. Yeah, he's my um, my my PhD advisor, my mentor, my friend, my role model. That's a great. What would what should you ask Max? And we will credit you with this question. Oh, so no. Well, let's now, make sure, now you're let's make sure it's a good one. Before <laughs> That's you... right. This will not be anonymous. No. Well, I mean, I, the, the, I, I'm not saying you should ask this, but I do I do wonder about it because we were talking about this earlier with other scholars. Is just his prolific writing, you know, his ability to write uh, book after book in high quality, thoughtful mm-hmm. form, I think is really I mean, maybe you should ask him that. I mean, yeah. I, and I, I, I have talked to him a little bit about it, but I think it's really interesting how he bridges. Um, the, the, here's how I, I think I see it, but but ask him if this is how he how he does it. What's bothering him? Like you know, he'll nine eleven happens. He writes a book about predictable surprises. Like what's bothering him in the world with the scholarship that he's doing and that he's reading from others, and then to like translation for a general audience. Like that little triangle is really powerful, but yeah. I don't know how he does it so consistently and so fast. So can there's, you ask him that? Yeah. There's a part of, of me search, right? That, that component that, I, that we've talked to a lot of people on the show where that whatever they, they, they wrote the book about or they did the research on has been because it had an itch for them. And, yeah. and they, they yeah. wanted to find it out. And I think, I think there's a really, I mean, even you just what you were talking about with yeah. how you decided to write, you know, this yeah. book. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's, that's really cool. So. Yeah. Uh, oh, I'm sure you're going to have a great conversation. I think it's his best book yet. I mean, and he's written a lot of great books, but complicit. I was fortunate to read an advanced version of it. And I, it, I think it's his most powerful, most personal book yet. Fantastic. Wow. Thank you. And Dolly, it's always a pleasure to see you. It really oh, is. You, you look fantastic. You oh, look happy. You. And it's just so much fun. Thank you for being a guest on Behavior Grooves. Well, thank you for having me on. Thank you for being such a educational yet joyful light in, in the <laughs> podcast world. It really is wonderful. <laughs> oh, thank you for that. Welcome to our grooving session where Tim and I groove on what we'd learned from our discussion with Dolly, have a free-flowing conversation, and talk about whatever else comes into our free-thinking, loving, reflective, forgiving ourselves brains. I like that. That was a long one. That was I'm, long. I'm and, sorry. And all, all spot on. It all, it all worked. I thought... That is Dolly. I mean, she is like this epitome of a of a big bear hug. You know, it's oh, just. I mean, just that's a perfect description. Of this it. is fantastic. It's always great seeing her and talking to her, and and I love the new book. I I, I love the work. I, I'm so glad that she continues to explore this story and to pull out the greatest ideas. She's always so good at encapsulating really big ideas in really cool terms. And I think we're going to talk about some of that in our grooving session. I just, I I love that she takes this component that is difficult, right? This idea that we need to face our past and not with rose-colored glasses on. Yeah. Take the glasses, take the rose-colored glasses off. But we have to face our past with a realistic 
perspective, but that realistic perspective doesn't mean that we can't have warts and wounds and ugliness back there and still not be a good person or not be a good country or not be good society as a whole. Yeah. And that is the piece that for me really resonated with well, me. And at the same time with this, and this is one of the, the first of several terms that we're going to re, re um, you know, refurbish here. She talked about belief grief. It's okay to have that sense of grief that we're kind of giving up something that we've adhered to, especially if you're super old like me that grew up with sort of a Pollyanna, a Pollyanna-ish view of the United States. You know, it's going to, we're going to have some grief around that and that's okay, but we can work through it. Let's name it, as Dolly would say, and work our way through it. As the thing that I loved about this was when she talked about dressing for the weather. Oh, right? yeah. So if you're going to go back and search the stuff and you know that it's painful, it could be distressing. Well, dress for the weather. No, if it's raining outside, right. you bring an umbrella, you wear a raincoat. Yeah. You know, the same thing of exploring your past. So you're going into a past that may have some stressors for you. Go in prepared. Don't go in just like, ah, here we go. I love she kind of boiled it down to what did she say? People are complicated and life is complicated and history is complicated. Let's let's not try to simplify everything so much that we take out the nuance and the variety. I think that it's it's really important. And that that kind of leads me to the second term that I really loved. And that was the paradox mindset. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so this is, you know, we want to smooth over the paradox. We want just, you know, find the things that are true and just let me let me hold that. I don't want to have to work so damn hard to hold these two things that aren't easily congruent in my mind at the same time. It's really hard to think of Thomas Jefferson as a slaveholder and as a guy who was the architect of the Declaration of Independence. It is difficult, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't do it, right? Agreed. That is the piece that I think Dali keeps reminding us is just because it's difficult doesn't mean that it's bad. Just because... It isn't easy doesn't mean that we shouldn't do it. Yeah. This idea that to move forward in a just way as opposed to just a recapitulation of everything that's just already gone on and you just kind of continue on in your uh, what might be a happy, easy uh, life. If you have to reflect upon it and you have to reflect upon it from a truthful lens, one that is fully encompassing all of the good and the bad, then, you know, these these paradoxes that uh, come up, this idea that Thomas Jefferson, great man, horrible man at the same time. Yep. And the piece that I think is really important on that is that's not just looking back in history. That's currently that's going on right now that you we can have these these paradoxes that are going on that somebody can be good-hearted and doing bad things, that they can be, um, you know, wonderful in certain aspects of their lives and not so wonderful in other per parts of their life. And I think part of the cancel culture that we have today and some of the other factors is like, ooh, we find that one bad thing and, then, and, yeah. and it just it gets translated. And again, we can go in, we were talking earlier uh, about just political parties and various different things. And so it's that same thing where all of a sudden, Yes, you can have good and bad on both sides of, of the aisle, and that doesn't mean that just because they have one bad component that they are – everything about them then gets tainted with this. Wasn't Annie Duke that said something about if someone from an, uh, the, the opposite political party that she could detest all their political views, but if they had a great recipe for salmon, like wouldn't you go, oh, okay, that's a great recipe? But we don't. We oh, go, yeah. oh, yeah. well, that's the <laughs> right, thing is right. like what Annie was saying is like we throw the recipe out because we don't agree with them on these other things. And I think that's the this this idea of having um, this, uh, you know, two – truths that contradict each other and being able to hold those together. And that is – that's difficult. It's hard and, and it's messy. This could exist in the corporate world as well. You might be working for a company that's uh, 10 years, 50 years, 75, maybe 100 years old. You could be working for a really old company that might have some aspects of its, of its history that you're not so happy about. Huh? That doesn't necessarily – or it ought not necessarily – not, you know, uh, completely disregard what's happening today. If the company's doing good work today, yeah. 
then embrace that. Embrace that. And at the same time, acknowledge that, you know, the history wasn't so great. Well, and even today. So, you know, I do a, a fair amount of work with pharmaceutical, biomedical, and various different phases. And I can tell you that the people that I work with, to a fault, are are good people that are Truly, trying to make yeah. a, a difference in patients' lives and various different things. And yet, we know that some of the practices that some pharmaceutical companies use are, are dubious and maybe even, you know, unlawful at times. And you kind of look at that and you're, you're going, okay, but I know these people and I know that there is good that they're doing. And yet there's this other side of it too. And so I, could, I don't want to go into those situations with a Pollyanna approach no. and just say, oh, everything there, it's, you know, butterflies and unicorns. <laughs> <laughs> but I also can't go in with this idea that, wow, these are the evil empire and everything they do is bad. No, I mean, the, the impact that they have had on our well-being and longevity and health across the board, yeah. pretty damn fantastic. Yeah, so, well said. Anyway. Well said. Kurt, what else, uh, as you as you think about what when we talk to – to Dolly, um, what else came to your mind? What, were, were there so, any of those of those kind of clever terms that, that she had that no, struck the, you? The, well, she had a lot, I, probably. I just can't remember because that's how I go. But the one piece that she talked about that I thought was really interesting was this idea that Dan Gilbert brought up about we're bad at forecasting oh, yeah. the future, right? Our, how, we, how we will feel. And then applying that to this retrospective kind of search to reconcile our past. And I think that is a key piece for people who are, who are sitting here thinking, uh, I don't really want to do this. I like, you know, I like the, the beliefs that we have. We like we hold on to them because they're part of who we are from our self-identity. Therefore, um, I'm afraid of losing that. And that's going to be painful. It's going to be hard. But as she said, look, we're, we're bad at forecasting our future. We're bad at forecasting how we're going to feel as a result of being able to say, Maybe that belief I hold about myself, about my society, about my family, about my community, maybe actually when I realize the truth around those, not so bad. Yeah. Well, uh, Trump and Lieberman, she brought up uh, their work about how things get blurrier in the future. So let's be aware of that. I, I feel like part of her message is be aware that – that we're going to misforecast our our feelings. I mean, not positive or negative, but maybe for how intensely or for how long we're going to feel something. And um, we're also just going to be less accurate about how things are going to go in the future. So let's give ourselves a little latitude, right? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> let's 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 try to just relax a little bit. Uh, the the other one of the other really cool things that she said was about how unlearning is much harder than learning, oh. right? Wasn't that just like oh again just saying it in such a simple way? We, we I mean how we I mean, know this right? We, how we long all have we talked about habits and yeah. un, you know Katie Milkman and some fabulous discussions about habit formation and and getting rid of old habits? Unlearning is much harder than learning. Right. So let's acknowledge that and. And at the same time, it might take a little more effort yeah. to unlearn something that, well, was for, in my own life, my historical view of the United States was a bit Pollyanna-ish. Yeah. So, or, or unlearn the habit of not sharing behavioral grooves with your friends. You know, that's a <laughs> that's a habit people could unlearn as they're listening to this. You could that's just right. start the by unlearning process by. Taking a moment and sharing it, sharing it, yeah. leaving us a review, putting a you know stars out there, all that fun stuff. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, and so, with that, we want to say thank you, thank you, thank you for uh, in, uh, sticking with us and enjoying this conversation. Just to let you know, we are recording this from Abbey Road Studios in London, and we're having an absolutely fantastic time doing it. Uh, we hope that you have a fantastic time uh, listening to our conversations with people that we have really come to love and admire uh, very deeply for the work uh, and the insights that they bring to us. So if you do have that inclination to unlearn something and start to learn something, please share it. And, and with that, today, we hope that after listening to this, you go out and find your groove. <laughs>